Good morning, folks. Today is January 23rd, all day. It's a Monday. Welcome to episode number 287 of Simply Cyber's Daily Cyber Threat Briefing. I'm your host, Dr. Gerald Osher, and over the next 45 minutes, me, Jay Smith, Harish Kumar, Greg Fowler, and Josh Mason are going to be bringing hot takes and hot cybersecurity news of the day, along with all of you and the rest of the chat. Good morning to you all. We'll be ripping through these top cyber stories, and I'll be giving my analysis and opinion on each of those stories and <clears throat> really trying to focus on what you need to know about the story or how it could relate to uh, operational cybersecurity. And if you're looking to break in the industry, there's going to be massive value here for you because you're going to hear the terminology, see the context of what's going on. Uh, it'll definitely empower you to be a better uh, professional, whether you're in the industry or going to be in the industry. And... <clears throat> blowing minds at uh, interviews because when you're just dropping bombs about how QBot surpassed Emotet in 2020 uh, in Q4 2022 you know you know you're like bacon Trojans come on I mean am I right Android malware am I right and and the interviewer is like oh my god like can you teach me and you're like yes yes just let's get the paperwork out of the way let's get this compensation package in place and then I'll mentor you and then you're like winning but before we do that, before we do all of that, before you are crushing it, let's take a second and say what's up to the stream sponsors. Starting with my good friend Eric Taylor and the whole crew at Barricade Cyber Solutions. Barricade Cyber Solutions is dedicated to helping businesses recover from cyber attacks and um, you know, basically mitigate or dampen the damage done by those cyber attacks. Cyber attacks can cause massive, massive issues for businesses and send dedicated, hardworking business owners into turmoil. But you know what? Barricade Cyber Solutions knows how to mitigate that damage done by cyber incidents, set businesses up for success, have a break glass in case of emergency kind of situation. It's wonderful. If you don't have a plan in place, you should get one. Check out barricadecyber.com. Links in the description below. You can see I'm looking at Barricade Cyber's website on stream right now. Eric Taylor's personal calendar. This is just such a great idea. Embedded on the home page. You click on a day that works for you. You click on a time that works for you. And all of a sudden you're on Eric's calendar to basically just have a conversation. You've seen Eric on stream before. He's a, he's a very approachable guy. He's about getting stuff done. Also want to say shout out and thanks to Recon InfoSec. Love those people. Eric Capuano, Whitney Champion, Andrew Cook, the, the gang over at Recon InfoSec doing a lot of things, including Thursday Defensive. Definitely check that out on Thursday. I will uh, mention it on Thursday's show, but I'll be there myself. Recon InfoSec's Managed Detection and Response MDR offering includes the people, process, and tech needed to deliver full-spectrum security operations to organizations of any size. Their MDR service, Recon InfoSec, includes fully managed SIM and SOAR, and their clients gain full visibility into their own environment, as well as any incidents being worked by the Recon SOC team. Long story short, I've said it a million times, but it bears repeating, especially if you're new here. Managed Detection and Response, also known as MDR, is an awesome service in our industry. It allows you to scale up and actually have a cybersecurity team at a fraction of the cost of what it would really cost to hire an entire team and then put all the tech stack in and then manage the tech stack. Like there's a lot that goes into cybersecurity. A lot of us just think of it as like the individual role. But when you think of like a living, breathing, functional information security. Pro oh, oh, oh. come on now. Jeez. Even, even, uh, <laughs> even the show wants to get on with the news. All right. We'll get into the news in a second show. Jesus. All right. Sorry. Check out reconinfosec.com. And uh, you'll see this, uh, um, it links in the description below. This is their website. Great group, especially if you're looking for MDR services. I want to remind you that I believe every episode of the Simply Cyber Daily Cyber Threat Briefing is worth half a CPE. So be sure to say what's up in chat. Uh, hashtag team replay if you're catching on replay. So you're in the comments there. Uh, ISC Square um, and ISACA. When I look at the uh, policies, makes sense to me, but check for yourself. Uh, but you could stack them two and a half a week, 10 a month. I think it's a fantastic way to engage with other professionals and get some CPEs. Now, if you're live, love it. How many are we looking at right now? It's so hard for me to see. 
113 on screen, 119 in the queue. So we're going to have ourselves a good little time. Now sit back, relax. I'll see you at the mid-roll. It is Callens. Mondays we do Callens Art of the Week, so stay tuned for that. But right now, let's get into the news, yes? Cybersecurity headlines. It's Monday, January 23rd, 2023. PayPal ah. accounts breached in large-scale credential stuffing attack. PayPal is sending out data breach notifications to thousands of users who had their accounts accessed through credential stuffing attacks that exposed some personal data. PayPal explains that the attack occurred between December 6th and December 8th of last year. The company detected and mitigated it at the time, and by December 20th, it had confirmed that unauthorized third parties logged into the accounts with valid credentials. The electronic payments platform claims that this was not due to a breach on its systems no. and has no evidence that the user credentials were obtained directly from them. Almost 35,000 users have been impacted by the incident, during which hackers had access to account holders' full names, dates of birth, postal addresses, social security numbers, and individual tax identification numbers. Ransom All right, so a couple things here. Spicy! I'm, just, I'm gonna preemptively spicy this, okay. A couple things here. First of all, uh, I'm seeing in chat Whole Cyber Human Initiative with the blue Simply Cyber Squad logo. Uh, that's the, that means, that that's the, 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 you've been here a long time. Thank you for the continued support. You can't, you can't get that uh, without being a squad member for a very long time. Um, so, okay, so a couple things here. PayPal accounts get breached. <sighs> the reason I did a preemptive spicy is because how are you not having multi-factor authentication on freaking financial accounts in 2023? Are we not, like, I'm, I'm feeling like I'm not doing my job well enough. We, as a community, are not doing our job well enough. You cannot be running, you can't be running cloud-based accounts without multi-factor. You can argue, you know, like, oh, maybe not all of them. Okay, fine. If it's got money tied to it, bruh, you cannot not have multi-factor authentication. It's imperative. Now, the second thing I'm going to point out, the reason MFA, credential stuffing, basically threat actors got passwords, which are all over the place. You can get password. I can get you passwords by nine o'clock. I can get you... The passwords are everywhere. Word lists are everywhere. Okay, guys? Word lists are for brute forcing. Credential stuffing is where a data breach happens, like the old LinkedIn data dump or whatever data dump you want. To, you want your, your choice, right? And there's usernames and there's passwords, right? <laughs> try to log, try to log, try to log. It's all automated. It's not like threat actors are investing time sitting there trying, trying, trying. No, they just automate it. And then they come back a little bit later and there's a list of accounts that successfully authenticated. Then they go either sell that initial access because that's a pretty hot commodity right now. Initial access brokers, check that out. Or they log in and move your money. Right? Change First, let's log in and change the email address on the account. Well, first, excuse me. First, let's log in and change the password so the actual victim can't log in. Second, let's change the email address so they can't like do password resets. Third, let's clean the bank account out. Let's do a PayPal transaction to ourselves. Mm. So these guys screwed. Um, PayPal looks bad. They're the ones who have to send the letter out, but they didn't do anything wrong. Literally, and this is, this is the relationship, y'all, between business and customer. PayPal did nothing wrong. PayPal could have had the... Actually, I'll say one thing. PayPal did one thing wrong. PayPal didn't require their customers to enable MFA. And that's a decision that they made internally, but but it, you know it's costing them right now. So some other data breach coupled with users that have crappy passwords or reuse passwords, whether they're strong or crappy. This is how these things happen. Guys, use a password vault. Use multi-factor authentication. And you won't be one of these lucky 35,000 people to have received this letter. Also, um, fun fact, fun, fun fact I want to share. Uh, if you got this email, obviously take action, re, you know, research password. But with this story getting out, you know what I would do if I was a, a threat actor? Send a fake PayPal. Your account has been breached. Click here to reset it. Uh, phishing email. Because... 
now, you know, people are expecting these emails. So be mindful that you might, you know, people might like, it's not like, I'm not a genius, you know, like uh Dr. Evil over here. And this occurs to me instantly. So look out for an uptick in PayPal. Your account's been breached. Phishing emails. Cause it's, it's, it's based in reality, man. Our gang steals data from KFC, Taco Bell, and Pizza Hut brand owner. Yum Brands, the operator of these names and also of the Habit Burger Grill fast food restaurant chains, has been targeted by a ransomware attack that forced the closure of 300 locations in the United Kingdom. Yum Brands operates 53,000 restaurants across 155 countries and territories with over $5 billion in total assets and $1.3 billion in yearly net profit. The impacted restaurants in the United Kingdom have returned to normal operations and are not expected to face any other problems relevant to the cyber attack. Yum Brands has confirmed that data was stolen in the attack, but sees no evidence that customer information has been exposed. Odin. All right, so this is pretty cool. Um, this is pretty cool. All right, so Yum Brands, $5 billion uh, in asset. Uh, 1.3 in profit, right? Not not bad, right? Not bad. 1.3 billion in profit. Um, gets gets ransomware. Data gets exfilled. Uh, I want to give a little hat tip to these guys. Um, obviously, they're even though they're like food and retail, they're running a pretty tight ship. In that they were able to recover quickly from a ransomware attack, and at least they told their investors that they have high confidence that the ransomware attack would have no notable impact on them. You could see here, ransomware attack would cause no notable negative financial impact, right? So business doesn't stop. The Colonel's 11 herbs and spices keeps on dusting drummies, right? You're still going to be able to get a, a Doritos flavored <laughs> uh, shell, uh, you know, or whatever they're doing here. And no one else pizzas the hut. Um, guys, the, the 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 story here is that I for one am super pumped. We're continuing to see more and more stories where ransomware threat actors are hitting businesses and having little uh, I don't want to say little impact because there was some downtime, but the the road to recovery is much shorter. the The value gained by the ransomware threat actors is much less. This is how you're going to. Um, you know, erode away the frequency and magnitude of these ransomware attacks if there isn't much return on the investment, right? If, if a threat actor spends time, money, effort, energy into an attack and doesn't recover enough money to make it worth their while, they're going to go on to other pastures, right? It's like fishing in a lake with like no fish. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, okay, this after a couple times going out to the lake, it sucks. You're like this. What am I doing? What am I doing? You're just going to, you know, go to a different lake or try hunting with a bow and arrow in the woods. You know what I mean? Like you're going to try what you're doing differently. So that's what I see when I hear this story. Way to go, Yum Brands. You know, small victory. An intelligence hack exposes a huge trove of police raid files. Detailed tactical plans for imminent police raids, confidential police reports with descriptions of alleged crimes and suspects, and a forensic extraction report detailing the contents of a suspect's phone. These are some of the files in a huge cache of data taken from the internal servers of Odin Intelligence, a tech company that provides apps and services to police departments following a hack and defacement of its website over the weekend. The group behind the breach said in a message left on Odin's website that it hacked the company after its founder and chief executive, Eric McCauley, dismissed a report by Wired, which discovered the company's flagship app, Sweep Wizard, was insecure and was spilling sensitive data about upcoming police operations to the open web. The hackers also published the company's Amazon Web Services private keys for accessing its cloud stored data and claimed to have shredded the company's data and backups, but not before exfiltrating gigabytes of data from Odin's systems. Wow. Okay. Google. All right. So there is a lot here. Okay. There's a lot, lot, lot here. Uh, there's a lot here, guys. Okay. So this story I, here. I recommend this might be worth if you have a few extra minutes, I'm going to drop it in chat. If you have a few extra minutes, uh, you may want to check this out.
All right, trying to get some more coffee up in this body of mine. Um, all right, so private company that does apps and data stuff for law enforcement, right? So law enforcement, public service, they contract with private company. So the private company has all this data on police officers and weapons and maybe tactical plans and whatever, right? They get they get raided, okay? Or not raided, but like um threat actor breaks in. Now here's here's a couple interesting things. The threat actor broke in, right? And stole a bunch of data. Now it seems to me that this is actually a little bit of like um like I always try to think of what's the threat actor's motivation. This feels a little bit like um a hacktivist. Okay? We don't see hacktivism very often. We don't see hacktivism very often, but um they the the threat actor went in, stole all the data, leaked it to a um transparency service, you know, like it this thing over here. I don't know what it's called, but it it seemed like it was a uh DDoS secrets, a non-profit transparency transparency collective agency that indexes leaked data sets in the public interest, okay? So they leaked it to a nonprofit that's going to uh, provide transparency, kind of like WikiLeaks or whatever. They also shredded all the data so that, that at the business, right? So now Odin, the business, doesn't have their own data unless they had backups offsite or something. And um, the 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 CEO went on public, you know, TV or a report or something like that, and said that they hadn't been breached. And then the hacker like went, you, you know, ham on making it very, very apparent that they had been breached. So again, I'm not 100% sure what the motivation was. I don't know if this if this is one of those companies that's like, you know, a cyber, not cyber arms dealer, but like an arms dealer where they're, um, you know, kind of selling to whoever and they do shady bad stuff. Um, or if this person was just whatever, uh, interested in watching the world burn. But it, it is interesting. Here we go. Okay. Little is known about the hack responsible. But the source of the breach is called all cyber cops are bastards. Okay. So this definitely supports my claim that it is a hacktivist. Uh, they do not like police officers. They want to screw up uh, all that stuff for the law enforcement. So, you know, there are real consequences though. You know, if there's undercover agents, if there's secret, you know, not secret identities, but like identities that are confidential, confidential informants, people who are criminals that are, you know, putting themselves at risk uh, in order to get lighter sentences or something like that, that could all be exposed in here. So there are, you know, human, human safety concerns as well, but this is hacktivism. Flag it um, and mark it. I'm going to actually put it in my hacktivism file. Parent Alphabet to cut 12,000 jobs. These cuts will affect 6% of Alphabet's workforce worldwide in teams including recruitment and engineering. This comes days after Microsoft announced 10,000 jobs would be lost and weeks after Amazon announced 18,000 job cuts along with similar announcements from Hewlett Packard and Salesforce. Daniel Ives of Wedbush Securities said, quote, the layoffs highlight irresponsible spending across a sector basking in hyper growth. Yeah. The reality is tech stalwarts overhired at a pace that was unsustainable and now darker macro is forcing these layoffs across the tech space. End quote. Yep. Yep. What's up, funky monk? Guys, here's the thing. Like, I, you know, I'm not some type of like freaking soothsayer or, you know, Nostradamus over here, but I've been saying this and everybody's seen it for months that the the tech layoffs, the recession, the, you know, the economy slowdown, it's coming. And it's, this is just another one. We're seeing the bigger, the bigger giants start to fall, right? Uh, Microsoft laid off 10,000 people last week. Google uh, is laying off 12,000 people uh, on Friday. Um, Amazon laid off 10,000 people. Guys, it's not good. And, you know, again, 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 obviously work your job, be good at your job. It, it is a, it's a transactional relationship. What's up, Jeremy Williams? What? Did we just become best friends? Yup. Dude, working for a company is a transactional relationship. You agree to do work meaningfully to accomplish the objectives that you've been tasked with in exchange for cash. Great cash, homie. Right? 
Yes, you can have you can be like, oh man, the mission here is righteous. Oh man, I love you know whatever happy hour Fridays or beer in the in the lunchroom or doing my laundry or whatever ping pong like whatever ancillary benefits they're offering you. But at the end of the day, if they took all those benefits away and increased your salary, you'd still work there likely, right? But if they took your salary away and they added a foosball table, you probably would quit because at the end of the day, that's not really what you're all about. Now, oh my gosh. So two things. One, there's a way of, there's a website called layoffs.fyi that I real it's I have it on my bookmark bar because that's how often I check it. And you can see here it tracks not real time, but pretty close. Uh, layoffs, right? Wayfair, the furniture group, 10% layoff uh, last week. Uh, some of these I don't recognize, right? Like Media Buddy, Vox Media. This, check this out, okay? The only thing I would say is, oh, there's Microsoft. Where's, where's Microsoft? There's Microsoft, 10,000 people. Um, all I would say is be mindful, stay sharp, don't think of your business as a family. Your family's your family, all right? These companies, here's the problem. And, and I get disgusted by this because it's so capitalism and it's so greed. Guys, during the pandemic, businesses were like shooting off, like, oh my God, there's like money everywhere. And they just, they like, it, 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 from, a, from a business perspective, it, I mean, it's not exactly one for one, but it's like, if I hire... It, you know, if we're making $1 million revenue where we currently are and we hire 10 people and that costs us, um, that costs us $100,000 because each person's 10,000, but we can double our revenue. Well, think about it. It's simple math, right? If we add, um, you know, say we add $1 million of liabilities through salary and compensation and 401k and crap, but we, we get a hundred million dollars in revenue because we're, uh, you know, deploying these people faster, quicker, smarter, whatever. They're going to do it all day, every day. And as soon as that well dries up, as soon as the lake dries up, it's, you're fired, right? I mean, it, there's no, the, as the employee, you have no, you have no say in it. You have no say in it. And that's why when people are like, oh man, I really want to quit. I'm going to give like a two week notice or a four week notice or an eight week notice because like, you know, I, I'm committed. Yeah, you have. I feel like you have pride in yourself and you don't want to screw the people who you're working with. But as far as the business goes, dude, they're not going to give you, hey, two weeks from now, we're going to lay you off. No. The, and the thing that I'm getting frothed up about mostly here is I've seen so many freaking posts on social media of people who worked at Google that found out that they were laid off when they went to work and their badges didn't swipe in some type of bizarre dystopian future there were like a line of people lined up outside of the front door of google and they would swipe their badge and if it turned red it meant you were fired and if it turned green you would access so people were like lemmings in line and they're like boop access boop uh -uh, laid off beep uh -uh, laid off right like that's how people were finding out and then there's like people with like 17 years 20 years at google like i saw one just before i got on stream the guy's like 17 years at Google, he's like, I found out I got laid off because I, I went to work at 4.30 in the morning to finish a high priority report. Um, and when my badge didn't work, that's when I figured it out. It's like, dude, think, think about this for a second. That guy's going to work at 4.30 in the morning. He definitely, that is definitely outside the scope of like what Google's expecting him to do. And he's doing it to be a good doobie. And this is like the, the contrast of how he's being treated against how he's treating the company. It's just, ugh. The, the, the days of the golden watch are so done, so done. And now a word from our sponsor, SafeBase. These days, customer trust can be an organization's strongest competitive advantage. But how can you develop and maintain customer trust over the long term? The answer is SafeBase. After implementing SafeBase's Smart Trust Center, many companies see shorter deal cycles, higher value contracts, and stronger long-term customer relationships. Some even achieve a 90% reduction in security questionnaires. You can learn more at SafeBase.com. That's S-A-F-E-B-A-S-E dot com. Yeah.
real, real quick. Um, the, the, I love thanks people sharing your stories in chat. Um, getting a pink slip to your desk is ridiculous. And I'm with Justin Loken. Um, if I ever, go, you know, I have my own business. I, I don't know if you guys know that. I have a LLC. It's called Coastal Information Security Group, and I do like my consulting and VC. So and um, you know, like the 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 YouTube money. It all goes into that business, but I have I have no employees. I I, I contract out uh, some work to people, but I have no employees, and I don't know if I ever will because of what Justin Loken's saying right there in chat. Like having to lay off people, it, it it's it, it's too emotionally impactful. I mean, it's it's devastating. You're taking away someone's livelihood because because you made a mistake. Now, if you're a large company and you're a middle manager, then it's not even your mistake. You're just the executioner. And yet, you know. So, I, I, anyways. Uh, really quick, somebody asked about the gold watch. Uh, basically, in the United States, it, in the 40s, 50s, 60s, it used to be you'd get a job um, at a company like General Motors or somewhere in the Rust Belt or wh wherever, a shoe factory. And you'd get the job at like 18. Maybe you go to college and you come back and then you're 22 and you get a job in management. But you work at the company your entire life. Maybe you get a pension, right? You're, you're a GM guy. You're a you're a John Deere person. You're a, a Goodyear tire woman, right? Whatever it is. And then when you retire after 30 years, they would give you a gold watch. That was like the the symbol of your commitment to a 30-year uh, obligation to a company. They were taking care of you with a, with a freaking gold watch. So, uh, you know, I, I, I poo-poo it because, you know, 30 years of my life, I think a gold watch is uh, not exactly a fair, <laughs> fair deal. But I digress. It's, a, it's an antiquated concept. Let's do the mid-roll. Yeah, I know, Alana. Alana's 100% right, too. I'm, too. I'm too progressive. I'm too inclusive. She's 100% right. Men were getting the gold watches. Women, not so much. Jess Bishop gifting subs. Come on, Jess Bishop. What? Did we just become best friends? Yep. Thank you so much, Jess Bishop. <laughs> Guys, enjoy the gifted subs. Compliments of one Jess Bishop, longtime Simply Cyber Squad member and Simply Cyber community supporter. Really, really appreciate it. Guys, if you don't know, I pinned a chat. I pinned it, a comment in chat or whatever you want. To, I don't know what that means, but it's pinned. If you want to click on it, I sent the email out today. So if you get on the newsletter, it won't be until next Monday. But I send out an email once a week with three pieces of actionable intel. It's about a 90-second read. You can copy and paste sometimes directly into an email to your end users. And it's all about good times. Um, I write it myself. It's good. So if you don't like it, you can unsubscribe. It's very, very easy. Very easy. No work on the Dell today? I'm not sure what that means. Uh, I have the email for the newsletter today. Perfect, yes. And if you sign up for it and you don't get it, check your um, spam folder, because I do send it from a platform that is designed for like mass email messaging or something like that. Uh, Gaming Cat, uh, DM me. Uh, you, I mean, yeah, you can print it. If you want to, hey guys, if you want to print it, if you want to print it, uh, go for it. Uh, share it. I intend, like, I actually make it so you're supposed to be able to forward it. Like, at the bottom, I say, did someone forward this to you? Click here. So, yeah, print it out. Do whatever you want. Oh, John Capello. What's up, Capello? Taking my CSCI 227. There's one of my students, bruh. Tuesdays and Thursdays, it's the Citadel class, 8 a.m. Yep. All right, guys, I want to remind you at 4.30, uh, it says 430 that's a mistake. At 4 p.m. today, I will be going live with uh, Haiku Pro. And guys, come join me and hang out. Jenny Housley, if you're in here, come hang out. Here's the deal. A lot of people are intimidated by cyber ranges and they don't know what to do. And it's like, oh, hell with it. I'm, I'm just going to not do it. Today's stream is all about like the basics of a cyber range. What is a cyber range? How to get involved with a cyber range? How do you get value out of a cyber range? How do you research to solve cyber ranges, okay? It's going to be very much an onboarding. Let's let's figure out how cyber ranges work. How can we use them to learn? It's a very, very, it's cyber ranges 101 today on 
uh, the stream. Four o'clock. Again, this says 4.30, so uh, if you want to be, you know, in the secret club, show up at four, because that's when I'm going to go live. I also want to tell you guys, it is Callan's Art of the Week. Every Monday, my seven-year-old uh, has developed a piece of art. He's the artist in the family. Now, you, you guys may know Mo Williams, Pigeon, Piggy, and Gerald. Callan watched a video on how to make his own pigeon, and this is his pigeon. You see, he's started autographing it himself. So this is it. Thank you so much, Callan, for your art of the week. We always appreciate it. Get your la-la-la-las on, y'all. la 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 All right, y'all. Let's slowly ease back into the news. Riot Games hacked, delays game patches after security breach. The video game developer and publisher behind League of Legends and Valorant says it will delay game patches after its development environment was compromised last week. The LA-based game publisher disclosed the incident in a Twitter thread on Friday night and promised to keep customers up to date with its investigation. They blamed the attack on social engineering and added that the breach directly impacted its ability to publish patches for its games. Cyber attack on new All right, well, I mean that's just a quick update. All right. Um you know, Riot Games, huge huge dev company, League of Legends is their uh main game that I know of. Um you know, basically this is a story. This is a story exclusively because it's a huge company that you may have heard of. They got hit with a social engineering attack. Um, probably a developer got their credentials compromised. Threat actors got in. Who knows what they did? Um, they're still doing the investigation right now. So it's actually kind of surprising that they um, published this. You can see here, this is their official Twitter. Systems in our... Hold on. Oh, God. Systems in our... Uh... Development environment would compromise. Usually, guys, so if you don't know, um, in software, it's very common to have three environments. A uh, development environment, a test environment, and then a production environment. And they're, they're sequential. Think of it as like a pipe, right? This is why continuous integration, continuing development, uh, DevOps, when they talk about the pipeline, this is what that is. Dev, test, prod. You develop in dev, right? Obviously, you push to test, you validate it, and then you push it to prod. Um, so their development environment was compromised. I don't know if that means their dev environment or the entire thing. Um, you know, way to go Riot Games for getting in front of this. They say that they don't think player personal information was obtained. So it was just maybe their source code, um, maybe some information, but they are screwed for a little bit and they're trying to get it sorted out. Um, I, you know, I guess also they may be saying it simply because patches aren't coming out. I don't know if League of Legends, if anyone, if anyone in, um, if anyone in chat knows, I, I'd be curious, is Riot Games or uh, League of Legends like Fortnite where there's like microtransactions? Uh, a lot of, so Fortnite I'm familiar with. The way that they make money is like they're constantly pushing out new crap to, to, um, to, for sale, right? Like it's like a new skin for, you know, $2 or a new back bling for a dollar, right? Uh, and it's all in this funny in-game currency, so you don't really understand how much you're spending. But basically, they're constantly pushing stuff. If they're not pushing, if they can't push to fraud, then they're not making money. Like, that's the end of the day. Um, so, you know, again, I'm very pleased in 2023, for the most part, to see companies um, have cyber resiliency built into their information security programs. So they're able to suffer an attack and continue to uh, communicate effectively, you know, um, manage the incident, uh, kind of quarantine it, and then, you know, ultimately get back to a normal uh, approved state. It's only, it's only when you have like nation state threat actors or very, very advanced um, ransomware threat actors uh, where you're like, you know, they're shredding you and you can't really do much. But for, for, for a lot of attacks, like this one's a secure, social engineering attack, you know, they're able to kind of get back up and running. So good on them. It stinks, obviously, but good on them. Voot Energy Supplier Limits Company Operations. A wide-ranging cyber attack on the Kulik Energy Corporation in Canada's Nunavut territory has crippled the company's administrative offices. 
Officials with the company said the attack started on January 15th, and while power plants are still operating normally, computer systems at the corporation's customer care and administrative offices are unavailable. The company cannot accept bill payments through credit cards, but customers can pay using cash or through bank transfers. It is still trying to determine what information may have been stolen or accessed during the attack. All right. Um, I wasn't fully listening. Uh, uh, but so so really quick, just to finish my thought on um, on this, because Casually Joseph brings up a really interesting point um, from an operational perspective. You t like the, half the reason this is an interesting story too is that Riot Games came out like they don't even know exactly what happened. The investigation's still pending. Normally, you don't disclose this. Um, casually, Joseph says because if the threat actor's still in, they could get spicy, meaning they could start doing bad stuff, even worse stuff. But what I would say is from a business perspective, right from the from the CISO's you know seat, you don't want to say anything because you don't want to uh, have uh, reputational harm. You don't want to start a clock if you have to start notifying people or notifying investors. You, like you don't want any of that stuff. I'm not saying that you don't tell anyone. I'm just saying, like you know, ultimately, I'm just saying that you typically want to have some control over the timeline on when public releases happen and notification and and messaging and spin and all those other things. So this this is a bit unusual that they're coming out uh, and saying it like this, right? All right. Now back to this one. None of it. Energy supplier. This guy's is a classic OT, uh, you know, versus IT. So operational technology, cyber physical systems versus IT infrastructure, um, you know, information technology, infrastructure, file servers, active directory domains. Um, here's the deal. This company, if you're in Canada, you know, this company got uh, ransomware. Their IT infrastructure got ransomware. They are still able to deliver energy to their customers. So your power is not going to go out. They're still generating power. They're still delivering power. The problem is their IT side of the house, maybe their email. It says their bill payments are, are down right now. So whatever systems they have for transacting uh, credit cards and stuff like that isn't up right now. That's the IT side. So so it's it's interesting because it'll be like, oh my God, energy energy company hit by uh, cyber attackers. But in reality, like the the business is what's hit. Like the actual product and production is still operational. Same thing with Colonial Pipeline, right? Colonial Pipeline, very similar story. Their IT infrastructure got hit by ransomware. Uh, so they were still delivering and generating product, oil and petroleum, uh, but they just couldn't like send emails and stuff. But but the story is si energy company hit. So people in the United States were losing their freaking minds, like like making a run on gas when it really didn't get impacted. Same here. Um, I don't know who still uses cash or like what like how are we gonna like go? Like I I don't know. Like none of it. How about you just like extend everybody's bill date for their energy bill two weeks until you get yourself sorted out. No, 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 no. We could take cash. Like who, like who's, come on, who's doing that? Anyways. Yep. Make sure that you have cyber resiliency in place. And to kill pilots facial recognition system as a way to exterminate rats. Oh, I, I, I got the a big world's thing about largest this story. pest control group is piloting the use of facial recognition software as a way to exterminate rats in people's homes. rent -to kill said it had been developing the technology alongside Vodafone for 18 months. The surveillance technology, which is already being tested in real homes, tracks the rodents' habits and streams real-time analysis using artificial intelligence. rent -to kills chief executive, Andy Ransom, told the Financial Times, quote, The technology will identify which rat has come back, where they are feeding, where they are sleeping, who's causing the damage, which part of the building they are coming from, where they are getting into the building from, and whether it's the same rodent that caused the problem last week. End quote last okay so um i've got a big problem with this story guys okay okay so they have a technology that can f like basically uniquely identify a rodent okay facial recognition they can identify a rodent and see oh like this is the same rodent that comes in every tuesday you know after after trash pickup like this is where they go. This is where they sleep, whatever. Like, like to me, 
and maybe I'm simple, okay? Maybe I'm simple, but to me, like the rodent population issue, like we've got this solved, right? I feel like we've got this solved. You just lay out traps, you 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 give them the poison or whatever, they take it back to their den and they share it with their other, you know, rodent friends, family, whatever, and they die. Like why why do we need what like what is the objective of this system? And I hate get your tin foil hats, everybody. Get your tin foil hats. Like, why do they need this system unless it's to pilot it? Like when we test medicines, we test it on rodents first, and then we test it on like monkeys, and then we test it on humans. This is an extermination system that uses facial recognition to uniquely identify a target. To me, I mean, I don't feel like I'm reaching so far that this seems like a very thinly veiled pilot of something much more sinister. Like a full surveillance state, like, like, um, V for Vendetta type world where it's like, you know, or, or, or like, like you've been selected, like you're like, based on your facial micro expressions and where you've been going, er you know, every day for the last two weeks. Thanks a for showing us where you're like, ha you know, your activist hangout is secondly, thanks for showing us what reporters you've been meeting with. And third exterminated, like, I, I don't know, guys, and I don't, like, this is a cybersecurity education program, so I don't like to go too far into this, but, dude, explain to me. I, I'll go back, I'll, I'll go back, yeah, dystopia. Like, go. I'll go back, I'll go back and read the chat, but explain to me w what what is the glaring problem that this system is supposed to be solving? Week in ransomware. Last week, the U.S. and France conducted a law enforcement operation where they seized the domain and arrested the operator of the Bizlato crypto exchange for allegedly money laundering crypto proceeds generated from ransomware and illegal drug transactions. Also last week, Vice Society Ransomware leaked the data for the University of Duisburg Essen in Germany. Shipping software supplier DNV suffered an attack that impacted the ship management software of a thousand vessels. The Los Angeles Unified School District confirmed that social security numbers were stolen in last year's ransomware attack. But in the good news column, Avast released a free decryptor for the Bianlian ransomware, and reports from both Chainalysis and Coveware illustrate that ransomware payments dropped approximately 40% in 2022 as companies refuse to pay and the enterprise invests in stronger security and better backups. This right. week on Super... Very nice. Very nice. All right. So it's, uh, you know, your weekly roundup here on um, ransomware. I want to uh, <clears throat> point out to everybody that there is a positive trend of ransomware um, going down, like ransomware uh, attacks going down because people are stopped paying. Uh, this is good. You know, we've been looking in the industry for like a silver bullet. You know, obviously the security vendors have been touting silver bullet solutions for years, but we, we've been unable to really mitigate down ransomware activity. And we finally started getting it done by financially pinching uh, the threat actors and doing raids, Europol, Interpol, bringing down some of the larger operators, making examples of uh, ransomware threat actors. So it's not completely eliminated, but it is uh, trending in a positive direction. Uh, one thing caught my eye, and I'd love to share this with you guys. Um, apparently, a guy named John DiMaggio spent months going undercover inside the Lockbit ransomware operation. And he wrote a report on it. Now, this is brand new to me. This is on Analysis One. I'm going to read this story. This looks interesting. This looks really... Holy crap, look how long this is. Damn, dude. This guy did a lot of a lot of uh, in-depth analysis and reporting. I'm going to read this. I'm probably going to post about it. Maybe blog about it. But uh, check it out. I just dropped a link in chat. This looks really cool. 
All right. So if you were just here for the news, thank you. That concludes the Simply Cyber Daily Cyber Threat Briefing portion of the show. If you got a boogie out of here, uh, be good. <laughs> Thank you so much. We'll be back tomorrow at 10 a.m. Eastern time for the Daily Cyber Threat Briefing on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Now, if you want to do a little jaw jacking, if you want to hang out, I'll be here for about four or five more minutes. Uh, just just chilling and, uh, and we'll have a good time. Thank you all for being here today. Be sure to like. I, oh, I didn't even tell you guys that. Like, it's too late now. I mean, you can you can still like on your way out if you got value out of the stream, educational or entertainment value. But um, it's it's a little late to, to have other people, you know, YouTube to promote the stream. But whatever. As, as a best practice, hit the like button. Thanks. <laughs> all right. Um, Good luck to Carrie, uh, community's own Carrie, who's taken a, a second half of the A plus, I believe, certification exam today. He's gonna crush it. Matthew Netchi, my man. Kimberly can fix it. This one's for Kimberly. Great cash, homie. Always, always good to see Kimberly. Jess Bishop throwing some love on the uh, gifted subs today. Thank you. Yes, Alana, crush your week is right. We're seeing some activity of Alana on LinkedIn. Alana, I love seeing you get out there and engage with the community. Shameless plug, Friday, 11 a.m. to 6, Tech Career Conference, check LinkedIn events or message me. Yep, check out the whole Cyberhuman Initiative on LinkedIn. Um, Paul, if you send me a link through DMs or something, I'll bring it up on stream right now. Bill Green, thank you for a great show. I appreciate that. Uh, recommend ways for preparing for the GCTI. What is that, uh, like Threat Intelligence Analyst, GCTI? Yep. All right. Cyber threat intel analyst. Let's see. Areas covered. 75 questions, two hours. This looks pretty cool. I like this. Uh, Joel Belton in chat. Who asked about that? Um, who asked about it? Theodore Cap de Sunor. Uh, jo look for Joel Belton in chat. He's a threat intel analyst professionally. He might be able to answer that question. Oh, Jenny Housley. Good to see you guys. Oh, hey, um, on the uh, Cybersecurity 101, um, uh, spend some more time on it. Got the, got the, like, the alpha testers going through right now just on form and uh, format on what it looks like. Uh, and then I've got a, a host of beta testers that are going to be beta testing. So I'm super pumped about that. Um, I also want to share with you guys that... Uh, I did some uh, thinking this uh, this weekend. Here's the uh, here. I'm going to drop a link in chat if you're interested. This is Whole Cyber Human Initiative uh, Cyber Career Conference on Friday, January 27th, all day. Uh, link in chat there. Go check it out. Uh, you'll hear from industry professionals. It's designed for pros at all levels who want to take their careers to the next level. Whether you're starting out or a seasoned vet, you'll find valuable insights. Give it a shot. Give it a check out. All right. Um, all right. So just just between me, you, and 197 people, I'm super pumped. I did some thinking. So the Cyber 101 course is going to be Simply Cyber's second official course in the Simply Cyber School. And the GRC class... Um, you know, I made a thumbnail for it. I had four versions. I, I put it out to the community. Kimberly, you may remember. Uh, and you, like you guys voted and helped me pick one. Um, so I wanted to do, like I'm inspired by uh, TCM and their cool, their cool like theme of their different graphics, right? Like when I got the GRC class on TCM, I was super excited to have the, um, I was super excited to have, like to pick out, I got to pick my own like, graphic right like these things you know i got like a little uh list of them and i picked this one this is mine right here and i loved it right so i was like i want a cool graphics now i didn't want to like straight rip off heath because that would be ridiculous but i was thinking what could i do what could i do so here's what i've done this is brand new i haven't shared this with anyone except my wife i shared this with my wife um check it out this is a teaser exclusive for you guys. So all of my courses are going to have keys basically. And I, I'm playing with it right now, but like, you know, this could be, 
this could be the GRC analyst masterclass, right? And this could be Cyber 101, and this could be Cyber 102. You know what I mean? Like basically, it's going to be, it's going to be keys because I'm helping. I'm, I'm in my mind. It's like this is a key to help unlock opportunity for you. This is, you know, cybersecurity keys and locks. Um, it's a key to, you know, the, the 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 key, the secret of how to do this, right? The the content I'm trying to make is like direct to the point, practical, actionable. I'm not fluffing around. I'm not upselling you or whatever. Like it's the key. It's what you need to unlock potential. So that's what's that's what's going on here. This is this is what I've decided. So stay tuned. Obviously, the graphics are just a fun grab ass type thing. The graphics aren't what's important. The content's important, but. I'm having a little bit of fun with it at the same time. So I hope you guys dig it. Hope you guys dig it. So I fil I filmed more content for the Cyber 101 course on uh, over the weekend. I I'm doing the tech primer right now. I did operating systems. I actually have to break operating systems. I found out as I was doing it. I have to break operating systems into like a Windows operating system and then a Linux operating system lecture. And then networking, cloud, software, etc. But stay tuned. <clears throat> stay tuned. If there was a way to make a keychain of all your keys when you finish. Ooh, that is cool, BSEC. I like that. I like that. Is there a haiku this afternoon? Well, Jenny Housley, yes, there is. It says 4.30 on the stream, but it's officially at 4 p.m. I screwed up when I scheduled it, but you know what? I don't have a team of people. <laughs> I don't have a social media team or a marketing department or anything. Uh, it's just me. So sometimes I probably like was thinking in my head um, of the Thursday live, which is 4.30, and I just did it. So I'm basically going to just go live at 4 p.m. And, and go YOLO. So come, come check out. Come stay with us. Uh, what program do you use for filming courses? I'm using Articulate. Uh, hey, William. Um, I mean, I guess I use Stream Streamlabs desktop. I mean, I make my, my slides in Google Drive. I, I record in Streamlabs. I use Adobe Premiere for editing. I use Adobe Photoshop for uh, graphic editing. Yeah. All right. One more minute here. Good to see you naturally. Me kick out some key STI files and we can make a real one. What's uh, what are STI files, James Randolph? I mean, if there's a way to if there is a way to take these keys and, and and do something fun with them when you have a bunch of them, I would love that. That would be cool. If there's somebody in chat who who has an idea on how to actually per operationalize that, holler at me. All right. Maybe I can, uh, it, it, like, maybe, I don't know if it's easy. I don't know. If, never mind. I was going to say I can make them NFTs, like not, not sell them, but just make them NFTs so they're unique. But I don't even want it. I don't even like just, I, I'm getting like cringe vibes, just saying NFT. So that's not happening. Oh, 3D print files. Very cool. Yeah. Maybe, maybe uh, after Cyber 102. So the plan is Cyber 101. And then a couple months later, Cyber 102. And then 2024, uh, I think I'm going to do a like a, in, a, in advanced practical uh, senior, whatever you want to call it. Like basically an advanced GRC analyst class. In my mind, like in my mind, like I, I want to kind of deliver the whole career, right? So like Cyber 101 and 102 is like for everybody. GRC analyst is like, you decided to go that career path and here's everything you need for entry level and then an advanced one. So like, you're gonna, you know, you're gonna be doing more advanced risk stuff. You maybe do like fair assessments, how to talk to um, management, how to, how to like manage a team, stuff like that. And then the final piece of that would be a uh, chief information security officer course, but that, that would be like 25, 2025 or something like that. So. We're working on it, guys. Slowly but surely. Yeah, GRC plus <laughs> plus. Um, yeah, you know what I'm finding, um, I, and I don't mind. I don't mind. But what I'm finding is the amount of content I'm sticking in the course is a lot compared to some other courses. But but I will say at the same time, I, I love 
uh, Heath Adams's courses, TCM. And I, I'm kind of looking to them as um, a standard, right? Like it should be this amount of content. It should be kind of done this way. I think Heath does a fantastic job. And, um, you know, also, also, I'm taking IT Pro TV's intro to uh, IoT pen testing right now. And I have an IT Pro account. And I'm getting a lot of good ideas from the way that they produce content as well. So if you enjoyed the GRC class, I think you're going to be very, very pleasantly surprised with the upgrades and quality that I've made for the Cyber 101 course. It's it's still me. It's still good content. But like it's just it's just more polished and more, you know, it's better. It's better from a quality perspective. All right. Maybe badges. Maybe. I got to bounce too, everybody. Be good. Thank you all so very much for being here. I hope you have a wonderful day. Crush it. It's Monday, January 23rd. You guys have been great. I'll see you tomorrow. Well, I'll see you later today at 4 p.m. for Haiku or tomorrow at 10 a.m. for the Simply Cyber Daily Cyber Threat Briefing. Be good, everybody. Thank you, and we'll see you out there. Oh, and until next time, stay secure.